Dear colleagues from Italy, hello from United Arab Emirates. And as you can see behind me, uh, Burj Khalifa. And around me are actually Dr. Lovely, who is a prosthodontist, and Dr. Reham, who is an orthodontist. It's our pleasure to be a part of educational program that was organized by Dr. Sepanaro. And we would like to definitely thank him before starting the lecture itself for this amazing opportunity. Definitely, we would like to see you one day in UAE, and we would be happy also to meet you in Italy itself. We will start with a very short video, and um, I believe that it will give you a short introduction about what we are going to discuss today. Here we go. Um, you should play, keep it on the wall. Yeah, so it's clear that we are going to discuss cleft leap and palate in 2023 because today in 2023 nowadays we do not approach a problem individually. We do it as an um, um, uh, interdiscipl in an interdisciplinary way, um, and it doesn't mean that, like for example, in cleft lip and palate, only a dentist is important or oral maxillofacial surgeon. But as you can see today, all of us, as uh, from perspective of uh, prosthodontist, from the point of view of orthodontist and the surgeon, uh, we will look into this problem. So the first thing that we need to know is uh, what is a cleft lip and palate. We understand that it's a most common congenital craniofacial abnormalities. If you look today at the literature, you will find a lot of different information about this. It is characterized by failure of normal fusion of the palate and the leap, as you can see, at the midline during the development resulting in a clinically obvious deformity of the newborn. What would come to my mind, first of all, is definitely that it would definitely affect not only the child, but of course the parents as well. Here we go, we can see, and this picture is showing us a lot that those people or those kids would have have a problem with eating um, uh, as well as speech would have been a problem. So those newborns would have have a, a problem and ability to, to feed in multiple ways. Um, uh, there would be a nasal reflux as well. Uh, again, as I said, inability to form an adequate uh, latch and the increased work of feeding leading to fatigue itself. Um, the first question that comes to everyone's mind, and there is a lot of scientists that are working on this, is to find out what is actually the reason behind it. Um, as I said, being one of the most conventional birth defects that a child can have, cleft palate is usually caused by environmental factors or through inherited genetics. Let's look at the next slide. So we can see that factors that could lead to orofacial clefting would have been genetics evidence, environmental factors, as I said earlier. Globally, what globally uh, researchers and scientists are seeing about it, and what is actually the prevalence of oral clefts in different populations. So we can see that 0 0.45 per 1,000 live births. Asian population, we have here the information, and the African population as well. Um, the next would be the incidence of cleft lip and palate and the epidemiology of perinatal deaths related to cleft lip and palate in Hunan, for example, province in China. So you can see that uh, there is an increase since uh, 2016 to 2020. And there is a lot of information regarding this. Um, here we go, the genetics. So the researchers are finding more genes directly associated with cleft lip and palate. Uh, for example, there is the recent study that was done in 10th of January, 2023. And the new study says that a research team led by the University of Lova identified three genes that uh, when deleted cause cleft lip or palate a facial deformation that occurs in about one in every 1,600 babies born in, for example, United uh, States. This is according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I would definitely recommend you to read this article because it would have given you a lot of different information. As I said, there is a lot of researchers that are really targeting this um, uh, 
this topic, as I said. So we understood that genetics are really uh, important to be known, not only by the dentist or oral maxillofacial surgeons, but from uh, different specialities as well. Here we go, another journal of stomatology, for example, and there is a global prevalence of cleft um, palate, cleft lip and cleft palate and lip, a comprehensive systematic review and meta-analysis. I will keep this for you. And by the end, by the way, we have a references, um, information where you could actually read about this. Why I stopped on the quality of life? Because we need to know that um, this kind of, um, uh, of deformities, or let's say, uh, cleft lip and palates are actually affecting the quality of life of those patients. That could lead to uh, the end story of that. Those kids would not study in the school because of bullying. They would not go actually and work uh, because they would always be shy and maybe others would bull them as well. So um, it has an effect on the quality of life of those children. By the way, as I said earlier, it has effect on the quality of life of parents as well. So um, uh, this medical condition can also occur from harmful medication that the mother ingested during the term of pregnancy. And this is very important uh, to know that, by the way, you should spread this information and awareness should be increased about this, that, by the way, the gynecologist is very important for this as well. And he needs to follow up on time with the, um, with the parents, in, fa in fact, with the mother um, um, who is pregnant at that moment. Moment. So if we look at the classification for cleft lip and palate, we can see that we have a Vo, Lashal, Kernahan, and Stark classification, right? So let's look at the Victor Vo, which was the, as, actually discovered in 1931, uh, distilled the complex and varied morphology of cleft lip palate into four major types. So we can see here the Vo1, as I am showing you. So the midline cleft of the uh, velum and soft palate would be actually involved here. Then we can see the the two where the midline cleft of the vellum soft palate and the secondary hard palate as I'm trying to show here up to the incisive foramen would have been involved. Uh, here we go about the V3 and we can see again that um, soft palate would have been involved, hard palate would have been involved and we can see that the alveolus is also involved. And the last one would have been V4 on this slide where we can see again that all of above um, or earlier mentioned is involved. At, on top of that, there is a leap that is involved as well. So uh, here we go, how it looks like. And uh, this is the detailed description. We will definitely share with you the slide so you can actually go through it um, in details and understand that um, what those classification exactly means. So we have Lashal classification here. This was proposed by the cranes. And uh, then they would actually divide it into, uh, let's say, right side, uh, alveolus separately, and lip separately, and hard palate and soft palate separately. So this is how it would look like. OK. So um, uh, I would go to the classification of cleft lip and alveolus and palate resulting an international survey. So um, since you could see that there is a lot of different classification, but which one should we use? Honestly speaking, and when we look at the survey itself, we can understand that it depends on the specialist himself because, for, because what is convenient for me might not be convenient for others. And this is the reason why it was uh, continuously developed. So uh, here is again another different articles that are saying that, for example, the great variety in the use of classification system exists among a craniofacial specialist international, and the result recommend the usage of the Lashal classification. But this is based on this uh, article. However, again, as I said, it's a very individual approach. So let's come to the most important. What problems arrive actually from the cleft palate? As I said, the eating problems, speech problems, and even sometimes the hearing loss would have been a problem for those uh, kids. 
Another issue that would come here is the dental issues that we can see a malocclusion. And here comes actually the role of orthodontist who is supposed to uh, be able to address this uh, problem. Uh, definitely emotional and social impact is very important because children with cleft may, self, um, may be self-conscious or embarrassed about their appearance even at a young age. So this is the reason why I say it sometimes they stop going to a school they stop working, they uh, do not get even married, by the way, and this is because of the emotional and social impact. And this is, again, the reason why we actually need to uh, raise an awareness about cleft lip and palate. So um, if we go to the diagnosis and the treatment plan, so uh, we can diagnose it um, uh, in this way. As you can see, prenatal diagnosis, surgical interventions, then the speech therapy would have been done, and dental and orthodontic treatment is very important. If you say that, uh, what's the role of gynecologist, for example? I would go back again and say that um, in most cases, a prenatal ultrasound can detect cleft palate as early as 16 weeks into a pregnancy, which means that actually we have a chance to identify it, let's say, on time isn't it? But we can't change anything about it. So let's look here, for example, this is the normal palette. Then here on the second picture, we can see that there is a cleft palette. So the recent technologies are very important. Um, as I said, here is the normal leap, and then we have a left unilateral cleft and bilateral cleft, which means that both sides of the leap will be involved. There is a surgical management, and uh, it may involve a series of reconstructive interventions, which means that when you explain to your uh, patient's parents, for example, or if your patient is adult, it's very important to explain to them that no, I'm sorry, but it will not stop only on a surgery part. We will need to follow up with the patient. We need to have interdisciplinary approach. Speech therapeutists, uh, orthodontists, prostodontists, all of them should be involved. And it might take, by the way, several years after the surgery as well. And sometimes you will need to go for the plastic surgery as well. Isn't it? So we have a cleft palate repair, pre-operative information. Um, you can find it on this website as well. And uh, by the way, there is a lot of information about the perception and attitude of parents' children with orofacial clefts regarding the use of pre-surgical orthopedics and feeding obturators. So you can see that there was a, a good survey about it. Um, here we go, Dr. Rihan, the floor is yours. Please uh, proceed with the role of orthodontists in cleft lip and palate. Thank you so much, Dr. Sabrine, for the great elaboration you gave us on the classification and the etiology behind cleft lip and palate. I'd like also to thank Dr. Sapanaro for um, including us and inviting us for this um, online educational um, um, lecture. So uh, the role of orthodontists in cleft lip and palate, uh, our orthodontic intervention usually our, or approach of sequencing and timing is usually a collaborative decision that we take as a team. So it's not solely, you know, uh, dependent on the orthodontist with, because as a team, we have to ensure the patient centered approach and we have to respect the patient's needs of course, and their families also, because we do deal with them at a very young age. So um, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you, doctor. Uh, so as you can see here, this is a graph of all the uh, different uh, medical and dental uh, specialists that usually cleft lip and pa uh, lip palate patients see throughout you know, their, their treatment. And as Dr. Sabrine said, the uh, time of treatment is from, I would say, infancy till the age uh, of adulthood. And usually these are followed by either maxillofacial surgeons or plastic surgeons later on. So usually the, um, the the treatment cycle starts with the genetic counseling, the uh, <coughs> the uh, the the uh, orthodontist, pedodontist, pediatric uh, uh, doctors, and so forth to evaluate the case of the patient. Now, in terms of orthodontics, we do see the patient during their infancy. So as you can see in this study that was conducted in 2023, uh, that 
is titled The Current Perspective on Plithlip Palette's Children's Health. They've advocated for three different stages of treatment that orthodontists are involved in. So the pre-surgical infant orthopedics, the interceptive orthodontics, and the orthodontic treatment growth uh, assessment. Uh, and that differs a little bit. This protocol differs slightly compared to the previous protocol that uh, demanded four different stages of treatment. So maybe in the last sli next slide, we can see, yes. So the, these were the, the different um, timings and sequences of orthodontic care uh, previously. So they believe that infancy from birth to two years of age, uh, was the first stage where we usually uh, fabricate a, a, a type of nasal um, a leveler uh, modeling uh, appliances, and then the deciduous dentition. And this is the phase where they no longer, in the new uh, protocol, no longer follow, which is the uh, deciduous dentition, which is two to six years of age, uh, because they believe this inhibits slightly the growth of the dental alveolar structures, number one, and can cause also, because of the expansion that is used to expand the palatal arches uh, that can cause you know, changes and deformity, especially of the nose. So now at uh, this stage, two to six years of age is no longer a treatment, but however, we do follow up with the patient. And then there's the mixed dentition phase and the permanent um, phase where we uh, go ahead and see and follow up with our patients and provide them with treatments. So in general, we, as Dr. Sabine kindly mentioned earlier, the uh, dental problems that we see in patients, and we have both local dental problems and orthodontic problems. And the local dental problems, the first thing we usually see are the presence of natal and neonatal teeth. So this is at birth, usually we tend to see uh, teeth that are present in um, the dental arch. Also something common we see is the congelatin missing teeth, which means teeth that are not uh, present in the dental arch. Uh, another type of, can we go back to the slide? Sure. Thank you. The change of morphology, which means either the teeth are too large or too small. Then we have fused teeth or gemination. And usually these are either two teeth that are united together or one tooth that separates to unite one teeth. Um, and poor periodontal uh, support. Orthodontically speaking, and what we assess usually on patients is a class three tendency, as if you can, Dr. Sabrine, maybe, uh, I'm not sure, can they see my- um, Presentation? My, my cursor? The can they see my cursor? Uh -huh. No, no, my cursor in the previous slide. You can, if you can just highlight the class three, uh, Dr. Sabrine. Yes, here. This is a class three where the upper teeth are behind the lower teeth. And this is something we see because of the deficient uh, maxillary growth. And usually we tend also to see cross bites, both interiorly in the interior segments and both on the bilateral segments. And in some cases, spacing and crowding, which is space between the teeth and crowding is when the teeth are don't have enough space <laughs> in between them. So for the next slide, so here is, as we said, the neonatal or infant, the nasoalveolar modeling uh, phase where we give a pre-surgical orthodontic appliance to the patient. And the idea of this appliance is to facilitate feeding, especially for patients at that time. Also, uh, this is why we, we tended to do this procedure at least one at the first week or the second week after birth or sometimes we can extend it till uh, four weeks uh, of, of age after uh, birth. So technically one month uh, after birth. And uh, maybe we can share with them, Dr. Sabine, the video. Yes. So here is a small video showing on what are the procedures? How do they uh, fabricate uh, these, um, yes pre-surgical orthodontic appliance. So I tried pressing on, but I can uh, maybe open again. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Nasoalveolar molding, or NAM, is a treatment option for children born with a complete cleft lip and palate. At Seattle Children's Hospital, specialized orthodontists offer NAM therapy for infants with unilateral, bilateral, and mixed clefts. NAM treatment begins as early as the first week of life and continues until the primary lip repair at approximately six months of age. The goal of NAM treatment is to reduce the severity of the cleft prior to lip surgery by closing the gap between the lips and gums and improving symmetry of the nose. The surgeon is then able to repair the lip more easily, resulting in a smaller scar with less tension on the lip and an overall better result. To begin NAM treatment, molds of the infant's nose and mouth are taken while the infant is awake. These are used to fabricate a custom appliance, which is then adjusted as the infant grows. Cheek pads are placed outside the crease of the nose to protect the baby's skin. A base tape is then used to help close the gap between the lips. For a unilateral cleft, the tape should be applied first to the non-cleft side, then stretched across the cleft while squeezing the lips together. The molding plate is inserted at a 90 degree angle and rotated into the mouth. Using one finger to stabilize the plate, two additional retention tapes are then used to secure the device in place. Parents are taught how to make the tapes so they can do it themselves at home. This is an example of two retention tapes and the longer base tape, which would be used for an infant with a complete unilateral cleft. Okay, so going back to uh, the, the video that we just saw, the idea of these uh, this appliance or pre-surgical orthopedic appliance uh, is usually to- Parents are given supplies at the beginning of NAM treatment and second. at every visit as needed. NAM visits occur weekly or bi-weekly. At each visit, the orthodontist will make changes to the appliance to gradually mold the lips and nose. So uh, based on the video we just saw, we understand that this NAM appliance uh, is usually, or the nasoalveolar molding appliance, is used to obturate the cleft area to facilitate uh, feeding for the infant and later on uh, a speech also. So the idea is to first uh, uh, make the palatal shelves slightly closer or you know, uh, reduce that clifting that is present in the area. Second, uh, secondly, is to close slightly the lip distance uh, that is present. And uh, Dr. Sabrina, maybe we can go to the next slides where we can show them. Yes, so these are the objectives technically of uh, this appliance that we use. Um, Later on, once we achieve the slight closure of the, the lip and the alveolar uh, bone and process, we can later on proceed and place the nasal stents. And usually this is used in a unilateral cleft lip and palate uh, because it would usually be on one side and then these would be on the uh, on both sides for the right and the left. And the idea is to uh, technically, non-surgically, uh, lengthen and upright the uh, the columella uh, area. Okay, so uh, this can also help later on the lip uh, surgery that we will cover. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Dr. Reham, for your elaboration on the part of orthodontics, we will definitely come back again. And um, again, as I said, additional surgeries could include a surgery to improve the appearance of the lip and nose and close openings between the mouth and nose, improve the breathing as well, stabilize and straighten the jaw, which is very important for their future function. Um, we need to emphasize for our patients and their parents is that, especially if their patients are adults, we need to discuss with them, but if they're kids, so it's our duty to discuss it with their parents. That surgery is usually successful. The risks are low. However, we need to inform them again. I'm highlighting this point that more than one surgery sometimes is, is might be needed. 
So cleft lip surgery leaves a very small pink scar that should shade over time and become less noticeable as the child grows. But definitely it depends also on uh, um, how the surgery was performed, at which age it was performed. All of this will uh, do a great difference. Uh, the children often need a treatment beyond surgery for cleft lip or palate. And some other treatments their healthcare providers may use are speech therapy and orthodontic treatment as we just discussed. So we have a haloplasty, and it's usually performed during the third six months of life, and there is not the big controversy of optimal timings as the, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, as for the palate repair between hospitals. Uh, here we go, this is the unilateral halorenoplasty, and uh, we can see the bilateral halorenoplasty. And then, by the way, this is a moulage or um, uh, a model where uh, some of the centers are actually uh, giving an opportunity to practice on it before actually practicing on the patient himself. Right. So uh, we understood the goals. Right. And to achieve those goals, cleft palate surgery must include closure and three year, in three layers, including a nasal layer, of course, and muscle layer and oral mucosal layer, of course. So we have to focus on a speech development, mid facial growth and the velopharyngeal function as well. Uh, treatment will, uh, for cleft palate will definitely depend on the type of cleft and the baby's overall health. And we already understood that there is a different classification and we understood that uh, not uh, necessarily that everything will be involved. So for example, leap and soft and hard palate. No, it might be only um, a soft palate, for example. So uh, clefts can cause problems with the child's development. So treatment is recommended to start as early as possible. But there is many things that we need to take into consideration, the hemoglobin of those patients, as well as the weight of the patient, because this might be a contraindication for the uh, general anesthesia. And definitely such surgeries are supposed and of course should be done under the general anesthesia. So simply anesthesiologists can reject to perform a surgery at early stage or at early age. Um, again, going to a cleft palate repair, or we call it as uranostephyloplasty, the surgery will be performed at 12 months and creates a working palate, and it will reduce the chances that fluid will develop in the middle ears with the help of special tubes placed in the eardrums to aid fluid drainage. Uh, there is a lot of different uh, techniques, and the most famous techniques are bone lankin bank palatoplasty, and this is probably the oldest one. And then we can see the Vivardil Kilner um, uh, VI, uh, VY pushback palatoplasty. Uh, this is the exact demonstration of this. Four low double opposing Z plasty. This will involve two reverse Z plasties, as you can see. We have also the Bomer flaps and uh, intravelar veloplasty, as we can see over the picture. Here we go with the intravelar veloplasty for a patient with the complete cleft palate and nasal layer suture, then the release of levator valley muscles would have been done. And then again, as we can see on the picture, C muscle sutured in the midline and oral layer sutured. So what we understood there, it's layer by layer that the suturing are supposed to happen. Otherwise, the, the, the function or the patient won't be able to function as we're expecting and we will lose our goal what we said in the beginning the speech is one of our goals for sure uh, children with a cleft involving the gum line may also need a bone graft when they are between six and ten uh, to fill in the upper gum line so that it can support permanent teeth and stabilize the upper jaw so once the permanent teeth grow uh, in a child will often need braces to straighten the teeth and the palate expander to widen the palate and definitely this will be not with a surgeon anymore the, this should be with um, with the orthodontist and dr Reham, we are going back to you uh, regarding the orthodontic treatment of transitional uh, dentition Dr. Reham, if you can just unmute yourself, please. So yeah. uh, the 
Usually the transitional dentition orthodontic treatment is around, as we said earlier, six to nine years of age. And the aim is uh, to really prepare the dentition that is adjacent to the uh, clift area for the secondary alveolar uh, bone graft. And usually the period of treatment is six to 12 months uh, where we use different types of appliances. So the first appliance we use it's called a face mask appliance. And maybe we can share the next slide so they can see the pictures. Yes, great. So as we can see here, uh, these this is the face mask appliance that we usually use with a uh, expander. So we usually call these a palatal expanders. And what they do is they expand the arch, the upper arch. Uh, at the same time, with the use of this um, face mask appliance, we push forward the premaxilla, because as we said, there are tendencies for class three um, appearances or skeletal class three tendencies in these patients and clip lip and palate patients due to the um, underdevelopment of the maxilla. So these appliances usually correct or are called orthopedic appliance because they correct the skeletal pattern to achieve an ideal um, skeletal um, form as we say so as we said first first of all we use these face mask with expander and later on we go ahead on the permanent teeth place our orthodontic brackets now in the next slide we would see that we are using an expander however it's slightly different than the previous expander it's it's less we would say um less um bulky it's a smaller expander, and this is called a quad helix. So usually these expand, uh, expanders are used when we have a severely collapsed arch, um, and we start by expanding using the quad helix, and it's called a quad helix because it has four coils, and we expand these coils just so we have uh, skeletal and dental changes and expansion that happens. And later on, we can go ahead with our previous appliance, that is the face mask and um, Hyrex appliance. Yes, perfect. And then once we are done with the expansion, with the orthopedic changes, which means the skeletal changes from a class three to class one, we can go ahead and bond our fixed orthodontic appliances on the permanent teeth only, in case especially where we have spacing, crowding, to enhance uh, the um, you know, uh, physical appearance and the aesthetic of the patients. So we say that, you, yes, exactly. So we said earlier that sometimes the um, uh, the bone grafting would be also important, and usually it would have been performed before the permanent canine eruption, and it would involve the grafting of autogenous cancellous bone from the iliac crest. So you see, it's another operation again that we were supposed to inform our uh, parents or or adult uh, patients. The advantage are that it minimizes the gross disturbances of the upper arch isn't it we can see here the cleft um, um, the alveolar cleft and um, it gives maxillary arch integrity with periodontal support for the teeth proximal to the cleft secondary bone grafting is now widely used and is considered a standard procedure for alveolar repair by the way in some of the countries you will find out that uh, they are not addressing this part and they would not even go with the uh, secondary bone grafting for example uh, we have uh, milan and oslo protocols so milan's protocol will involve repairing the lip nose and soft palate at four to six months of age and conducting hard palate repair with the gingiva periosteplasty between 18 to 36 months. Oslo's protocol includes the lip and anterior palate as you can see, yes, and uh, uh, the closure is supposed to, to happen using the Bomer flap at three months, uh, soft palate closure at 18 months, and secondary bone grafting at eight to 11 years before the canine eruption, as we, by the way, discussed earlier. Um, however, you can see in different current countries, there is um, uh, protocols that are used by the different uh, doctors, and some of the surgeons that would actually develop uh, their own protocols 
or their own way of flap. For example, uh, my professor and supervisor, Professor Yusuf, was using a one flap that he would rotate towards the area that he would like to close uh, because of the, the, the wide uh, palette, let's say. Right? Uh, again, going back to Dr. Riham about the permanent dentition stage. Yes, so for the permanent dentition stage, and usually this is the final, we would say, not really the final, but it is towards the end of the orthodontic approach or intervention. And it's usually towards the age of 16 to 25. Um, and this is where we need to assess along the uh, maxillofacial surgeon, whether we will go for orthodontic treatment solely or would this patient need to also go for orthognathic surgery um, later on uh, in his age, um, you know, for skeletal corrections, if he still has some skeletal problems that are still present um, in the uh, skeleton. So uh, the idea of orthodontic treatment in this uh, point is to align teeth to make sure that we have a good, um, transverse relationship in the palate so we have no longer any cross bites presence um, and we make sure of the stability of the occlusion uh, in the presence of dental compensation in the area so what are the stages we usually see um, the patient uh, we align we go ahead again with the fixed orthodontic appliance we make sure that the alignment is proper the settling of the occlusion is proper this is if we go solely for orthodontic treatment however if the patient also would require future orthognathic surgery, which means um, either a maxillary advancement or a mandibular setback or so forth, then we can go, we treat the patient first of all by extraction, asking the surgeon for, for extraction of upper uh, and lower third molars. We go ahead with our fixed orthodontic appliance to correct the sagittal transverse and vertical relationship of the teeth. And then we go for decompensation in some cases where we worsen the case. We worsen that class three uh, and we go for uh, example extractions of upper uh, second premolars and lower first premolars. Then we go ahead and correct the buccal torque and the buccal segment. So the side of the teeth, we make sure that they are in somehow a harmony. Once we reach to a very heavy wire, which is one of the heaviest wires, we use 21 uh, by 25 TMA wire. We then go ahead and fabricate our surgical splint. We wait for four weeks. Once we reach to this wire, we go and fabricate our surgical splints and refer uh, our case to the orthognath, the, the maxillofacial surgeon, where he will perform his orthognathic surgeries. And then we will see the patient to perform the last stages and final adjustment of the teeth um, in terms of the roots, uh, especially uh, inside the alveolar bone. And we end with uh, our orthodontic treatment. So uh, here are um, the small uh, types of treatments that we provide the patient. So here we can focus on the last point, which is treatment plan. So if the patient still has a uh, very mild class three discrepancy, then what we go ahead and go for dental compensations and dental compensation means extraction of teeth. So we camouflage that class three by extracting, for example, the lower teeth so that they go back. Uh, and then we have a normal appearance of a class one patient. In case we have moderate skeletal discrepancies, we go for orthognathic surgery. Uh, and maybe we can elaborate next time more, Dr. Sabrine and I and Dr. Lovely on this point. And then we have in severe uh, skeletal discrepancies, we can go for something called um, distraction osteogenesis. And this is the, the picture here on our right is the distraction osteogenesis. And technically it's the lengthening of the bone somehow uh, to produce so we produce cuts in the bones and we separate the bones uh, to allow the healing process. And while it is healing, there is the formation of new bone. And what we use is usually an internal, as you can see here, distractors in the area, internal distractors devices. And then we use an external also uh, distraction device that will expand uh, the sutures and aid in the new bone formation. Thank you so, so that much. is all orthodontics. <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, so it's not uh, only orthodontics. However, we can see again that multidisciplinary approach uh, will not end up with orthodontist or a surgeon. Uh, or there is a role of a surgeon, speech therapist, dentist, and psychologist. And it's very important to collaborate on all of this. So again, dental care of children living with the cleft palate. So here we come with the information that a pedodontist is also uh, uh, involved in this um, uh, patient's care, as we can see. So uh, 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 Dr. Riham already elaborated on that part. So advanced in treatment, again, would have been the surgical techniques, speech therapy, innovations, and supportive technologies. Um, as I said earlier, none of this would have been able to happen successfully if it would have not be a multidisciplinary approach. And this is why I will ask Dr. Lovely to kindly elaborate on this part now. And honestly, I am more excited to hear about it than anyone else. Dr. Sabreen, thank you very much. And I, am, I appreciate Dr. Riham and Dr. Sabreen for the elaborate uh, presentation. It was very excellent. And, and my special thanks to Dr. Sepanaro who uh, invited us for this uh, special webinar on this. So going forward, can you go to the next slide, please, Dr. Sabreen? So here, uh, actually, uh, prosthodontics is basically to make appliances. That is basically what we do here. And we have certain reasons why we make these appliances. So the mainly, we can make these appliances on unoperated pallets and on operated pallets and later during orthopedic interventions and uh, surgical intervention and for speech therapy, we give these uh, appliances. So let's go and see what are the different type of things we can work on. So a prosthodontist, as Dr. Sabrina and Dr. Riham were specifying, it's a teamwork. It's not just uh, one person's cleft palate, cleft lip uh, in treatment is a teamwork. This is all the slide says that we have a teamwork going on here from nasio alveolar molding to a prosthesis. Next slide, please, Dr. Sabri. Thank you, Dr. Sabri. And here, Dr. Sabri has already elaborated on the epidemiology, but just a quick recap of two things here. One, cleft lip and cleft palate are more for the males. And when it comes to the cleft palate alone, it's more prominent for the females. And when you see the difference between left-sided clefts and the right-sided clefts, you see that left-sided clefts are more common. Next slide, please. I will be skipping areas that Dr. Riham and Dr. Sabrina already covered, like the classification part of it. Uh, so this part we will be skipping. Again, unilateral, bilateral, Dr. Sabrina already told all these things. Okay. So coming to this uh, cleft palate defect, what is the role of a prosthodontist in this? Why are we brought into this picture? One, as Dr. Riham said, it is, and Dr. Sabrine said, swallowing difficulties are there. For babies, suckling difficulties are there. Then speech difficulties are there. And above all, uh, the clarity of speech is affected. So these are the main areas that the appliances play a great role in. So next slide, please, Dr. Sabrine. So when you look at a normal speech, certain phonetics like, for example, D, T, F, we need the palatal space to be closed properly. If not, you will not be able to pronounce these terms clearly. So that's where the appliances again play a role. Next slide, please, Dr. Sabri. So what are the indications for a prosthesis? So the main indication is when any of these things cannot be corrected surgically, or by an orthodontic appliance, especially the speech part of it. And if the, uh, the gap between the palate cannot be connected properly by a surgical appliance, then we need to go in for a prosthodontic appliance. Next slide, please. So that's why in some surgical cases, 60% after the cleft palate repair is done, still they might need prosthesis after the age of 30, because the complete surgical closure might not be possible in certain cases. In such cases, uh, definitely prosthodontic appliances are required lifetime for this patient. Next slide, please. So what are the contraindications? It's very surprising to know that appliances also have contraindications. The main two contraindications is 
uh, retarded patients who cannot handle the instructions that has been given or maintain the appliance properly or uncooperative patients who are not willing to go in for appliances, it's very difficult to uh, maintain the appliance in a proper way. So that's the contraindication. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, well, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, uh, the cleft palate, as said, it's a teamwork. So I'll be just going directly to what are the types of processes. Next slide. So type of appliances. The type of appliances are divided into two categories, active appliance and the passive appliance. Active appliances, as Dr. Riham said, when you want to do a nasal molding, you want to get the shape of the nose, so surgical closure is easier. Such cases, we give a active appliance. Passive appliance is like the prosthodontic appliance just to keep the function normal. That's when you give a passive appliance. Next slide, please. Now here, just uh, to recap a few things on the impression procedures, this was taken from a journal of Thirupati SP. Uh, the, there are three things that are very important in the impression procedure of the infant, especially the small infant. One is the infant should be fully awake. This should not be, infant should not be sedated. Second point is the infant should not be fed for at least two hours before the impression procedures. The third point is hospital setting is better advocated because in case any complications like, you know, uh, the, uh, the some impression material went inside the lungs, such complications can be avoided. High volume suction should be always kept at hand. And then there are a lot of controversy in the positions. It's always better to put the baby face downward position to take the impressions like this. So this is a way that impressions are made with the face down so that the impression material does not go and get locked anywhere, okay? Yes, next slide, please. So then you make a mold. This is the nasal molding that Dr. Riham was talking about. So already she's covered that, but what am I going to emphasize here? The point is that even after you give these appliances, two things should be checked. One, can the baby suckle properly after giving these appliances? And second, does the baby have a gag reflex? Because the baby cannot tell, the baby cannot show the gag reflex. But as a uh, prosthodontist, we need to uh, figure out whether it is causing a gag reflex, the appliance is correctly extended or not. This is where we have to be very careful with. Next slide, please. And if there is a problem in the retention or if there is a, a problem in the gag reflex, we have to alter it with hard acrylics and soft acrylics. We have to use both these to alter because whatever area is going inside the tissue area need to be relined with soft material and whatever is outside can be contoured with hard material. Okay, next slide, please. And finally, as Dr. Rikham said, he used band-aids and the protection. It's already mentioned. I'm not going into the detail of this. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is nasal stent. So there are different types of nasal conformers. Either you can use as a stent so that the gap is maintained and the shape is contoured for the surgical procedure to be made better. So the surgeon finds it very easier to do a surgical procedure if the shape of the nasal area is maintained well. Next slide, please. As this. And one point that was not mentioned earlier, if you look at the previous pictures here, the nasal stud, uh, you know, it brings out the nose. It should not be placed inward. It should be flared outwards so that the baby's nasal shape is maintained. This is one point that I need to specify at this point. Next slide, please. Now, what is the benefits of it? Uh, uh, the complications are there. Sometimes it can get overexpanded. The nostrils can get overexpanded. Imagine one nostril small and the other nostril overexpanded. So always uh, the appliance, uh, when you deliver an appliance to the patient, it should be ensured that regular follow-ups are there so no complications can come like overexpansion, sometimes locking up. That means your appliance can get locked inside there. So regularly trimming the appliance to fit properly should be Maintain. Can you go to the previous slide, please, doctor? Yeah. And uh, the failure of taping can fail, retention can fail, ulceration can occur. These are the complications. So all these things should be properly and routinely uh, evaluated and rechecked. Next slide, please. 
Coming to the appliance, there is another type of appliance in which there's a pre-maxillar repositioning appliance. I think it comes under the orthodontic part also, but there's slight overlapping between me and Dr. Riham today because it's uh, appliance part also comes under prosthodontist and comes under the orthodontist. Here, what they're doing is they are contouring the pre-maxilla in, they're shaping up the pre-maxilla so that further surgical procedures can be done uh, in a very better and neater way. Next slide, please. So these are again ortho part of ortho appliances in which already Dr. Reham spoke about expansion appliances. I'm not going to touch on this. Next slide, please. And nasal confirmers also have been discussed by Dr. Reham. Next slide, please. Okay, this is regarding the nasal confirmer, how it should be uh, every two to three weeks, the patient has to be recalled and we have to check whether it is performing the function it was intended to perform. If not, it should be realigned, it should be adjusted and recontoured. So this should happen every one to two weeks. Now, this is the main area where prosthodontists, no, next slide, please. This is the main area where the prosthodontists come into play. That means in two cases, one, the surgery is being performed, but the surgeon is not able to close the complete gap. You need an appliance. Second, the patient refuses surgery or patient has not gone through the surgical procedure from the small age to the big age. So it cannot be closed in one day, those times. So these are the two times when you need a palatal obturator. As usual, the function of the palatal obturator do for soloing, speech and a proper aesthetic function. Next slide, please. So there are different uh, obturators. This is one obturator for the babies in which there's good adaptation. The, uh, the impression already has been shown in the previous slides. So next slide, please. This is called, so now in the appliances, prosto appliances, there are so many appliances in prosto, but regarding to cleft lip and cleft palate, there are two appliances mainly. One is the speech bulb and one is the palatal lip. What is the difference between speech bulb and palatal lip? Speech bulb has a huge hollow prosthesis which enables you to speak the phonetics properly and, you know, uh, speak with clarity. Palatal lips, when there's a huge soft palate lesion, which cannot be covered, you give palatal lips to lift up the palate so that the closure food uh, can be swallowed normally. Yes, next slide, please. Here, this is a case of a palatopharyngeal obturator. You see the extension. From the normal extension, the the pin goes behind the soft palate area and lifts the palate to close for the foot and the hard palate and you know, for the normal functioning of the soloing mechanism. Next, please. Now, need of the processes, uh, systemic need, anatomical, functional, social disturbances. Patients cannot, if they have a small gap in the palatal hard palate, the food will come through the nose, nasal area. So this is going to be a social concern for the patient itself. So such areas, we need a prosthetic appliance for sure and for lifetime. Next slide, please. So this, this one is, a, uh, I mean, procedure for making the impression. So you can use a normal stock tray is preferable or a custom tray. But initially to make a custom tray, you need a normal stock tray. The stainless steel one is the normal stock tray. So the tray is only of that size. But what about covering the extension defect in the soft palate? You cannot cover with this tray. So you need to extend it with a wax and then make the impression to get that soft palate impression. Next slide, please. And then you fabricate it uh, in a permanent way. See, this is done for a completely edingeless patient. You fabricate it and you mold the soft palatal region. How do you mold that area? You have to ask the patient. Next slide, please. Molding the soft palate area has to be done with certain moments, like moving the head forward, moving the head backward. You have to ask the patient to uh, speak certain vocabulary and uh, phonetics so that that area get molded to how it should be proper. Next slide, please. So you make a loop and then you use a modeling plastic or a wax that can contour that area properly and then get a good impression and make the final prosthesis. Next slide, please. So this is molding procedure. You use after extension of the soft palate area, you use a specific um, pressure indicator paste. You apply it on that region 
to check whether there's any pressure on the lateral walls of the palate. If there's any pressure, that has to be recontoured and adjusted to the patient's uh, comfort. Otherwise, there can be ulceration and uh, severe pain for the patient. So more than the appliance, the patient can have pain from the appliance. So that should not be the problem. Next slide, please. So once the molding procedure is completed, you trim it, check all the extensions and uh, confirm that it's satisfactory and then make the final prosthesis. Next slide, please. Here you confirm it. Confirm that this molding is very good and then the process is removed and then the final obturator is made. So what is this uh, obturator? Because see, sometimes the soft palate defect will be so huge that you cannot make it um, completely filled with acrylic. So you need to make it hollow. So what we do is we just line it, put salt, uh, some sort of a salt within the um, area, cover it and then make uh, another acrylic. Next slide, please. So it will be, you will be able to understand better. So this part, depending on the thickness, we will only have a hollow obturator. We will not cover the entire thing with acrylic so that the patient, you know, the weight can be tolerated by the patient of the prosthesis. So we generally make a lightweight hollow obturator prosthesis. There's a specific procedure for that. Uh, so that part is, yes, next slide, please. Yeah, you make that hollow region in, in the model and you make it really hollow. You don't fill it completely with polymethyl methacrylate. Next slide, please. And the different type of defects. The defect need not be always in the center of the soft palate. The defect can be to the medial side or to the lateral side. Median defects are more complicated because if there is a small gap in the prosthesis, the foot can come or water can come through the nasal uh, area. So imagine you have uh, some drinks or you have something to drink and uh, liquid comes through the nose, this problem. So processes should ensure that there should not be any liquid or food coming through the nasal cavity. Next, next slide, please. This is a lateral defect. See, lateral defects. So median defects is easier to handle because you get a proper seal. But lateral defects are a little more difficult to handle because it's near to the ridge and the moment is excessive. So you might not get a complete closure here. Next slide, please. So this is what I meant by a hollow obturator. If you see down, see the height of that uh, soft palate region from the normal area to the hollow. You cannot fill it with a hard mass. So you need to make it hollow. So generally we make the base, then fill it with salt and make the outer covering. And then with a small hole, you remove the salt completely. So the inside of the process is hollow. Next slide, please. Now coming to the recent advances, why this has come, this is uh, excellent this time because Imagine a small infant, alginate. What are the materials we generally use? Elastomeric impression materials, alginate, impression compound. There are three problems with this. Any impression material gets locked anywhere in the undercut. You cannot remove it that easily. So that will be a huge problem. So whenever you do a prosthodontic appliance, the first thing you have to check is, is there any undercut that my material can get lodged to? If, if so, it has to be blocked out by a gauze or anything. So then the second problem is gag reflex, the patient's liquid thing going here, there. So to avoid all this, intraoral scanning has come into the uh, new ream. And so you can avoid all these problems with the intraoral scanning mechanism. Next slide, please. So this is a patient that we did in a clinic, um, in our previous clinic. See, so you see, it's a huge opening of Bella Fellinger appliance. So an appliance was given. Next slide, please. See, the impression was made, an appliance was given, and uh, a re-impression was made here. Everything was perfect. Appliance was seating perfectly well here. But the patient was not very happy because of the, uh, this appliance because she said, food is not coming, water is not coming through the nose, but I cannot speak properly. So we ordered the corrector wax. There's a uh, orange wax in the corrector that uh, like you know you keep it in the normal mouth temperature like 37 degrees celsius it can mold correctly so this appliance the palatal surface that is where the surgery and the other orthodontics can sometimes fail because the palatal depth cannot be gauged by anyone the palatal depth cannot be gauged so see in this appliance we applied a layer of uh, wax corrector wax and asked the patient 
to leave it in the mouth without bringing hot or any water for around three, four hours, asked him to say S, F, P, phonetics, speak normally. And then what happened, the speech improved. We did a speech analysis for this and we termed this paratography and wherever the speech was proper, when the speech became very good, like S and Th were mentioned correctly by the patient, we copied that surface and reproduced in acrylic and gave a prosthesis. So sometimes even a prosthesis has to be modified. This is, you know, this was a like, you know, for us itself, it was a new finding. And uh, I don't, I think we were the first one to report this paratography regarding to the cleft palate patients. Next slide, please. So the patient was very happy with the, Solution was innovative and the patient was very happy. See, that much amount of acrylic we had to add. We didn't know that until the speech therapy, I mean, speech uh, test was done for this patient. Till then, we were thinking of prosthesis is excellent. No food coming anywhere. The retention is good. Uh, fluids are not coming through the knees and everything was good except the speech. So this is how we remodified the appliance for speech therapy. Next slide, please. So common errors that we can make is not doing a proper diagnosis, finding out what the patient's main chief complaint is. All these can be common errors and how to and the hygiene part. We have to specifically give a good post-operative instruction regarding to how to use the prosthesis, how to maintain the prosthesis and recalls are very important every three months, sometimes even uh, weekly recalls. So uh, next slide, please. So this conclusion, I think Dr. Sabreen, Dr. Riham and myself has uh, to, a, to a large extent tried to uh, conclude the whole topic for you in a way. So every way it's a teamwork and uh, each of us have dealt with our speciality in the way that we were uh, dealing with in the routine practice. So thank you very much from my side. I think over to Sabreen, Dr. Sabreen now. Yeah, actually, uh, before going to the uh, the final part of uh, this story today, um, there is um, a video that I sh always show to my students in the lecture, and I believe that they remember this video more than my lecture sometimes. So let's look at this, please. Hello, I am Ashwarya Rai Bachchan. My life has truly been blessed. But sometimes I wonder, what if I'd been born with a cleft lip? If my parents had abandoned me. If I never had any friends, if I could get yeah, one, no one should have you. But I was simply saying you can pick the clip. Just like that. Yeah, so it was a pleasure to be with you, even though it was virtually uh, in Italy itself, in Rome. And uh, we will be definitely even more happy to see you face to face in future. Um, I would like to thank before everything again, uh, Dr. Sapanaro for this great idea. And I would like to thank Dr. Riham and Dr. Lovely um, for the amazing, I can't say, uh, you know, input because actually the full lecture was covered by uh, each and everyone in the details, uh, honestly speaking, it was not superficial at all. But um, I think we need to thank you as well before for your patience, for giving us the opportunity to listen to each other and to look at those specialities or this problem from the different specialities. So I think the thanks should go to you. Um, again, Dr. Sapanaro, thank you very much for everything. And um, in case if you would have any kind of questions or you would like to contact us, you can see on the last slide um, our emails and you can approach us definitely through that. And finally, um, there is a lot of references that we have used today and all of the doctors did their best to uh, bring up the latest references that could be available um, today in a PubMed and um, other uh, resources, uh, as we know. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, dear colleagues. And I, I, it was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.